Great. So I, I'm actually going to be give, uh, on the board for most of uh, the time uh, today, but uh, I thought that I would at least put this up just because it's, it's a fun story and it's a fun quote that's relevant uh, for what we're going to talk about today. But, uh, all right, so uh, I'm an experimental physicist. Uh, my lab is in the physics department over at MIT. What uh, we, in general, do is we take an experimental approach to questions in theoretical ecology. And so we basically have populations or communities of microorganisms in the lab where we are interested in kind of turning different experimental knobs to explore some uh, classic ideas from theoretical ecology. So what I wanted to do today, and actually just over the next three uh, days, is uh, to give you kind of maybe an ecologist's take uh, on population dynamics and uh, evolution. All right, so we're going to be taking a little bit more uh, of the uh, ecology view of many of the questions that you guys have been hearing about over the last week or two, and then um, then we'll kind of try to see how how the ideas relate. All right, so just so you have some sense of wh uh, where we're going to be going. Uh, so today, oh. okay, start starting here. Okay, uh, all right. So today, what we're going to do is talk about population dynamics. By this, what we mean is we're going to focus on n. Right? So n is going to be the relevant variable, the population size or density. Tomorrow, what we'll do is think about evolutionary dynamics. But again, with a little bit of a different take from what we might have seen before. And here, what we'll really be doing is focusing on F, the fraction of the population that is following strategy or that is some particular mutant. Okay? And then on Wednesday, we're going to try to combine these things, and we're going to think about what we could call interspecies interactions. But a key takeaway from uh, what we'll, we'll be discussing is that interactions between, say, two species are very similar to interactions between, say, different strains within a population. Right? So in this sense, the ecological dynamics of interactions between species are in many cases remarkably similar to the evolutionary interactions, the, so the interactions between different subpopulations within a given population. And so we'll kind of see uh, how that plays out. All right, so here we might be talking about N1 and N2, or we might talk about N, sorry, and F. All right, so two different species, the population sizes, versus total population size and the frequency. Um, all right, and, uh, okay. So, uh, right, so today what we want to do is just think about, uh, think about populations. So in particular, we're going to consider some, uh, some population that, for now, we're going to focus on really the interactions within the population. All right, so there's some uh, population of some organism that we're interested in, and we really want to focus on how is it that its population size is going to change over time, and why is it going to change in the way uh, that it does. And so in many cases here, we're going to be abstracting away from uh, all the interactions that are taking place between this species and everything else. Uh, and we're just going to try to consider some different phenomenological models of what might be happening and uh, what are the consequences. And right, so the, the, the very, very simplest thing that we might do is just to imagine that we have a population that is, we'll say, non-interacting. And by non-interacting, what we mean is that not interacting basically with itself. All right, so the happiness of me as an individual in this limit does not depend upon uh, all the other individuals in the population, whether there are a lot of you or a small number of you. But in, instead, if, if we just have non-interacting populations, then the way that the population size will change over time is going to be very simple. And right, so we're just going to get uh, exponential growth. So we just have a situation where, in particular, the per capita growth rate, which is a quantity that we'll often be thinking about, so this is 1 over n dn dt, right, is just some constant. Right? And the important thing here is that this is a constant that is not a function of the size of the population. Yeah? 
right? So if it's positive, it means the population is going to grow to infinity. If it's negative, it means the population is going to shrink until it gets to zero. Right? But the key thing is that this thing is not a function of the size of the population. Okay. Uh, now, of course, any time that you have exponential growth, you always have to ask, well, uh, it can't go on forever. Uh, and uh, the nice thing about things that can't go on forever is that they won't. All right, let me see. Uh, I just want to put up this thing if it works, just because it's a fun story, maybe. Um. All, right. Uh. All right, so this is, uh, this is a story that, as far as I can tell, uh, was first recounted in this book by Ibn Khalikan in the 13th century. All right, so he was a historian in uh, what is now uh, present-day Iraq, and he was recounting the story of the beginning of, uh, of chess. And as far as I can tell, this story is not actually true on multiple levels, right? So the, probably the part with the chessboard, nor the part about chess itself, right? So I, as far, you know, from my, you know, I, I flew here from the United States, so I can't sleep at night. So I, you know, then I, it gives me a lot of time to Google all these things. And as far as I can tell, yeah, we, the, we don't know where chess started. But, uh, but, the, but the, the story, at least, that was uh, told uh, by, by this historian is that it, it came about when this guy Sissa uh, went to the king of uh, some part of India. So that's why I wanted to include it, because it's the most famous story, I think, about exponential growth. And it happened, I don't know, does anybody know where King Sriram was based? No? All right. Well, all right. So I'm, I'm going to say right here, but I, you know, I don't know um, what that exactly means, right? Okay. But yeah, so King Sriram, some part of India, and he liked games, but the, at least according to the story, it was the, Sissa was one of the wise men came and said, all right, you know, here's a new game for you. And the king loved it, okay? Because it was a super interesting game. And the king said, all right, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to reward you by, you know, giving you whatever you want, you know? And then, of course, there's all the, a lot of different stories about the gold and silver that were offered, but the, the key thing is that this wise man uh, was, uh, was very wise, or at least he was, he was good at, uh, at doubling things. And he said, well, you know, I don't really want it very much, but, you know, we happen to have this chess board here. So maybe we can take use of it and we'll just put, you know, a grain of wheat on the first, two on the second, four on the third, and so on. He said, well, you know, just we'll do that and then we'll, we'll call it even. You know, and the king, he, uh, he did not study exponential growth. Right, so he, uh, he said, sure, that sounds good, but then, uh, but then there are all sorts of problems, okay? And actually, I don't, I don't need it anymore, so maybe uh, we can even raise it so that uh, we can uh, have the board. Thank you. Uh, right, so, okay, so this is a, it's a famous example of what happens if you double things a bunch of times. Right? And indeed, this is, this is something that we can see uh, in the lab anytime we want, right? because we can go and take a flask all right, and here we have media, meaning something that bacteria, for example, can grow on. Okay. We can start with a single cell. All right. Now, we say, all right, does anybody know how, how long it takes for an E. coli cell to divide in optimal conditions? If it has all the food that it wants and it's nice temperature, 20 minutes, right? So 20 minutes is this famous thing. Okay, so 20... 20-minute division. All right, so just starting with a single cell here, you can ask, well, what happens? Over one day, we're going to get, what, 72 divisions, right? All right, so that's a, that's, a fair, that's a fair number. It's useful to be able to do back-of-the-envelope things, right? So 2 to the 72... It's around, right, so 2 to the 10 is around 1,000, right? So this is 4 times 2 to the 10, and this is to the 7th. Okay, so this is around 1,000, 21. All right, so this is around 4 times 10 to the 21. All right, it's going to be a bit more than that, but it's around there. Okay. All right, that, and, you know, and it's not that this is an impossibly large number, but it's more than you're going to be able to grow, for sure. I mean, I think that if you, if you run the numbers... It's like the mass of an elephant or something, you know. So it's, you know, but that's one day of growth. If you try to let it go for another day, then you get something's more than the mass of the Earth. Okay, so very quickly you get to unreasonably large masses. Say, okay. All right. So this is just starting with a single cell in a flask and letting it divide. All right. So this is saying, okay, that 
It may be that this is a fine model for the early stages. You say, okay, well, you start with a single cell here. It's probably not interacting with itself. All right, it divides and it's getting mixed up. All right, so it's probably still not interacting with that neighbor far away. Another division, now you get four. All right, so at the early stages, it may make sense to say that this is non interacting. But over time, you expect that eventually something's going to happen. Eventually, they're going to be talking to each other, could be in good ways. But generically, eventually, it has to be in bad ways, in the sense that eventually they have to limit growth, because you, you're not going to be able to get to 72 divisions. Right. Now, the question is, well, what's the, what's the natural way of incorporating that in, in these sorts of models? All right, so it, over here, we had this per capita growth rate. And it, I think it's always useful to plot things. Right? So here's this gamma as a function of n, the size of the population. And here, we have a constant that's independent of the size or the density of the population. Okay, so density independence. Okay. Now, if we wanted to modify this model to allow for the fact that eventually it has to stop growing, right, there are a couple things we could do. Right. One thing is we could say, all right, well, if we, if we want it to stop growing at some population size, we could just say, let it get up to there and just force it down to zero. So that would be a simple thing to do. But then, you know, you may not feel very comfortable about that because that would say the population didn't, wasn't bothering, it wasn't interfering with itself at all, and then all of a sudden it stops being able to grow. And so perhaps the more natural assumption to make is something that's known as logistic growth, where if you look at the per capita growth rate, and so this is basically, from the standpoint of an individual cell, for example, how fast is it able to divide? As a function of the population size, we know that it has to start at some value, we'll say r. Eventually, we want it to stop growing, and we'll call that k, for the, and it's a carrying capacity. Perhaps the simplest thing to do is to just draw a line. Ooh. Now, this can be viewed in some different ways. I think often people think of this as a law of nature, and I think that that's, uh, that's a mistake. Rather, this would be what I would say is a natural kind of parsimonious model for what should happen for a per capita growth rate. If you know you want to start somewhere and you want to end somewhere else, then you might as well draw a line. Right? So you could think about this as a Taylor expansion of, some, of something, right? that it's, just, it's, a simple, it's a simple null model. Now, there, there's a couple, you know, anytime that you see a feature like this, it's worth thinking about what kind of dynamics might result. Okay. And in particular, you can see that below the carrying capacity, the population, the per capita growth rate is positive, right? So the population is going to be growing. And actually, we can also think about what happens above the carrying capacity, where the per capita growth rate is negative, right? So this has the basic features of something. We say, okay, well, something's going up, something's going down. Now, you might reasonably ask, well, are there any circumstances, for example, R and K here, and we're, we can go out and write, write, the, write out what this equation would be. So we have a dn dt, right? We want it to start at this R value. For small population sizes, it's going to grow exponentially. And eventually, we want it to stop growing. Okay, so this is just the equation of, uh, of this plot. Okay. But given that if we're below the carrying capacity, we have positive growth. Above it, we have negative. All right, so the question that you might have is, can we get oscillations? All right. Are oscillations possible? Is it possible for us to, say, get oscillations around the carrying capacity. All right, so maybe we get growth. All right, so I'm a big believer in this active learning movement. All right, so this is where we're gonna, you know, we're gonna try it out. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna vote with our hands. Okay, uh, thumbs up is possible. Thumbs down is not possible. Does, does a thumb mean something 
bad in India. Okay, good. <laughs> I just want to make sure that I don't. <laughs> All right, does everyone understand the question? In this model, I want to know, are oscillations possible? Okay, and in, say for some combination of R and K, some parameter, you know, can we choose some parameters that, make, that lead to oscillations in this model? Okay, so this is a yes, oscillations. This is a no, no oscillations. Maybe think about it for five or 10 seconds before, and then we'll, we're gonna vote together. It's part of the fun. All right, do you need more time? All right, then we're gonna vote. Ready, three, two, one. All right, so I'd say that we have uh, quite a few po po you know, say, people saying yes, oscillations, and quite a few saying no, not oscillations. That's great, because that's exactly what we want for this peer-to-peer -peer, you know, learning. All right, so what we're gonna do now is, you, you know, some of you are sitting by yourself, so you should maybe find a partner. So go uh, turn to your neighbor and discuss. So you know, why is it that you said yes, oscillations, or no, not oscillations? All right, we'll let go for 30 seconds, 45 seconds. How far over can I go to the, is it to the next line or? All right, so. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and reconvene. Was anybody convinced by their neighbor uh, of something? Or were you able to convince your neighbor of something? Uh, all right, or I, I hope that you're at least talking about this problem, otherwise I'll, I'll be very sad. Uh, would somebody like to volunteer? What? Uh, well, maybe if you and your neighbor agree on it, then maybe you can, you can volunteer what, what, what you're thinking and why. Yes. Okay. Okay, all right, okay, so this is interesting. All right, so you're saying yes, you think that there are oscillations, and the reason you're now saying this, okay, maybe there's gonna be growth up to the carrying capacity, and then eventually maybe cell death. And you're saying, okay, well, once there's cell death, and then now you're gonna say, oh, maybe it's gonna be able to come back up. Yeah. Right, so there could be, right, you're talking about hypoxic conditions, right, because the, the oxygen is used up during growth because maybe they're, right, they're, they're using the oxygen to eat the glucose. All right, so this is a, okay, so this is a, so th these are all, uh, many possible explanations for why it might be oscillating, right? Yeah. Okay. So would somebody like to do a rejoinder to that argument? Okay. So now you're you're agreeing that there are oscillations or not? Okay. So this, right, so what you're saying is, all right, when there's cell death, some of those nutrients, other things get released into the media, and then other cells maybe can use that, and then they can grow. Okay, All right. but what about the people that thought there should not be oscillations? Right, okay, so you're saying if the growth rate is slow, then maybe they'll smoothly go to carrying capacity. Okay, but maybe if I increase the growth rate R, then maybe I can get ringing. Maybe? Okay, yeah, so um, other... Uh, all right, so n is equal to k, then, it's a, there's a, then dn dt is equal to zero, is what you're saying. And therefore, you're saying what? That you're saying that it should not oscillate. Okay, all right. All right, so, I, um, so all of these things are, are, are good like, things to be thinking about. And part of what I like about this is to be very clear about the difference between a model and the system that we're trying to model. Right? 
There are many reasons that any given system, for example, might oscillate. Right? And you gave some good explanations. Right? And, and those could be happening, but I want to be clear that here we, we have a model where we've made some assumptions. Those assumptions may or may not be good assumptions, but in this model, none of, the, like, none of those biological effects that you were talking about are, are present in this model. Right? So, and part of what I think is, is valuable in this context is to, to always be very clear about you know, which things are we trying to model, what are the key features of that system, and then we want to write down a model that maybe is going to capture some essential elements, and then it may or may not capture the key things that we want to, that we want to be modeling. Right? So in this, it turns out that this set of equations, it, can, it will never oscillate for any R and K. Right? And that's, that's the feature of the model. Now, the experimental system that we might be interested in, it might oscillate. And what that's saying is that this is then a bad model for, for the system that we're trying to model. Right? So, I, so I think that this is, this is partly why, though, we write down a model is to think about what assumptions are we, are we putting in, and then if, it, if those assumptions are not sufficient to lead to or to explain the qualitative behaviors that maybe we're seeing in some system, that means that we have to add more bells and whistles to the model. It means that maybe the model was too simple, right? So maybe we have to add a delay or something, right? So, so I think that part of what I think is useful is um, it, by, by writing down a specific model, a set of equations, we're very clear about our assumptions. Okay? Because in words, it is true that large population size is going to shrink, small population size is going to grow, and that's the basic elements that you might say could lead to oscillations. But it turns out that you actually need something more than, than is captured in this model. Right? So there are a few different ways of, of thinking about it. One, one, one important point here is that this is a first order ordinary differential equation. That means that for a given value of the population size, it uniquely specifies how the population size is going to be changing. Right? So if you look at something like this, where there's an oscillation, then at any given population size, at k or at any other population size in here, what you see is that the population size here is growing, and over here is shrinking. But it has the same value of n in both cases. Whereas in one case, the slope is positive, in one case is negative. Right? So what you can see is that that is not actually going to be allowed for any first order differential equation where you have just that a given value of the population size leads to a given value of the slope. Right? So not only are oscillations not allowed in this model, but not in any uh, first order differential equation. You know, if you put in a delay or something like that, there are a bunch of things you could do to lead to oscillations, but, actually, but this one does not. And it's also maybe just worth pointing out that we can, uh, we can also non-dimensionalize th this equation. In general, many, uh, many cases, we, uh, we can uh, choose the unit of time and the unit of population, say, size, in order to see how many real parameters do we have to play with the, to change the behavior of the model. Right? So if we redefine the, if we say, right, a little n is defined as being big N over k, and we also Right now, a new time, I want to make sure that I get this, is... All right, so we can redefine our unit of population size and our unit of time. And if we do that, we get... All right, so in this case, because we can define the, our, uh, the unit of time for our stopwatch, and the unit of population size, in this case defining it as a fraction of the carrying capacity, we can actually get rid of both of those parameters. And what that's saying is that the behavior of this model is really, in some, in some real sense, is not even a function of R and K, hardly, because we can't get qualitatively different kinds of behavior in this model, because we can actually make them go away if we just measure the time and the population size and the appropriate units. Yes. Right, so yeah, so it's a, this cannot have a limit cycle. Because it's a one dimension, exactly, yeah. That's right. And that's, that's what I was saying here, is that, yeah, you can't have, uh, and, and you can't even have neutral oscillation. Yeah, so you can't, yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, right, so this is, uh, this is a simple model for population growth that leads to, uh, 
to a stable equilibrium carrying capacity. We can draw what these trajectories look like. Um, so if you look at, oh, and I just want to be clear. So this is not trajectory for this model, just to be um, clear. All right, so if you look at the n as a function of time, uh, what you get are simple things where it grows exponentially and then smoothly comes to the carrying capacity. You start above it, it decays down, and you could start anywhere, you know, you could start at different ends. All, all these trajectories just go to smoothly to this equilibrium population size, the carrying capacity. So very simple behavior. I do want to mention uh, one, one other thing in this context, that in, in the context of, for example, cell growth, where many of us work, we also uh, have a, a simple thing that we believe, which is if you ask, how is it that the division rate of a cell uh, will change depending upon the nutrient availability? Let's say that there's some limiting nutrient, a sugar. We want to ask, well, how is it that the growth rate of a cell, the division rate is going to depend upon say, the concentration of that limiting resource. Okay. Well, if, if it's an essential resource and you don't have it, the concentration is zero, what should be the growth rate of the cell or the, of the population? All right, so I'm going to be plotting here the per capita growth rate of the population as a function of the concentration of some essential resource. This is a concentration of an essential resource. Okay. The question is, if we don't have any of the resource, zero, right? Good. So we start here. The concentration gets very large. Should go to something, right? Should go to some, you know, we, you know I, we'll call it here, we'll call it some R max. Now, there's a question, all right, well, what should it do in between? And there's a court from some early work by Jacques Minaud. He found that, there's a, uh, that a simple equation that looks like michaelis menten type dynamics fit the data quite well, where it starts out linear and then approaches This is not an exponential, just to be, uh, just so you know. All right, so the growth rate is a function of the resource concentration. In this case, according, you know, in the model of Minoud, is that it looks something like this. All right, so for, for low resource concentrations, the resource, uh, it, the resource concentration is much less than this kappa, this Minoud constant, then we just get, we can, we can neglect this R, right? So we get that the growth rate increases linearly with the resource concentration. But for large resource concentration, and large, anytime that somebody says large, you should always be thinking large relative to what, right? In this case, large is relative to this Minode constant, where uh, in that case, you just get to R max. Okay? So this is indeed, this is the same functional behavior as uh, this uh, michaelis menten kinetics in the context of, of enzyme kinetics. Now, for enzyme kinetics, there are a class of models where you can really, where the assumptions in the models are quite good descriptions of some enzyme, some enzyme mechanisms on a molecular level that lead to michaelis menten kinetics. And I, but I would say that node growth law here is, again, a bit more of a phenomenological law in the sense that it works pretty well in many circumstances but it doesn't have the same rigorous underpinnings that I'd say michaelis menten kinetics do. Okay. But, but it works pretty well. Okay. All right, so the question maybe then is, if you have an organism that's growing on some, say, sugar, right, and it's following this Minode growth law, the question is, will that reduce to logistic growth um, as, as the resource is being used? Okay. So let's just imagine that we, now we're going to be, now this is going towards a, a more of a resource explicit model. Here, what we said is, all right, well, for, there, there should be something 
that's limiting growth of the population, right? So it shouldn't grow to infinity, should stop growing, and we're going to say at some value, some size k. Okay? But we didn't specify why that was happening. Right? It could be because of resource limitations, just the resources being used up, or it could be that, that you're running out of space, or it could be that a toxin is being secreted as you grow, and that limits your growth. It could be many, many things, right? but here it's a purely phenomenological description. Okay? Whereas you might want to instead go and think about a resource explicit model. Okay, and I'm, all right, I'm going to draw here. Right? And so a resource explicit model might say, well, dt is going to be just given by something like this. But it, now it's a function of the resource concentration. Right? Not, we're not going to think of it as a function of n, but as the resource. Right, so we have here. R max. But we want this, we have to add an n here, and it's great. Okay, but now we're going to assume that as the, as the population is growing, that the resource is being exhausted. So we have some dr dt, which is just minus, as it's being used up, there's some proportionality constant associated with dn dt. And so this is just saying that as a, new as a new cell or organism is being made, it takes some resources, and that causes the resource concentration to go down. Different ways of modeling perhaps the same thing. And it turns out that in this model, um, you know, you will get, starting with low population sizes, you'll, there's going to be exponential growth, because this is going to be something, whatever R is. Right? And then eventually, the resource is going to be exhausted, and so you're going to get saturation. All right, so on a very basic level, it is true that you start at some value, of course, some division rate, you know, at the limit of low population density or size, and then eventually it reaches uh, it reaches zero because the population stops growing when the resource is exhausted. Okay. But then the question is, does this more resource explicit model map to this, say, logistic growth model? Okay. All right, we're going to go ahead and do a vote, and then I'll t and then I'll maybe tell you the answer. The question is. Does this lead to that? All right, so this Minot, does Minode growth lead to logistic growth? All right, so the question, we're going to say yes, no, or depends. All right, so now we get three options. All right, so think about it for 10 seconds. All right, if you have, do these set of equations kind of reduce to this set of equation, or this equation? Let's go ahead and vote. And it's OK that you haven't had time to really, but it's, I think it's worth just making a guess so that you, have, you know, put a, a stake in the sand, as they say. All right, ready. So yes, no, or depends. Ready? Three, two, one. All right. OK, so we got a, you know, all right, fair range. All right, so that's great. All right, so why don't you turn to your neighbor, discuss it for a minute, and then we'll, we'll talk about it.
Okay, why don't we go ahead and uh, reconvene. All right, so what we're trying to figure out or think about is just under what, what circumstances, if any, will monode growth lead to logistic growth? Okay. Uh, so monode implies logistic question, uh, question mark. So monode going to question mark logistic. Um, um, and uh, the answer is that it depends, meaning that for some parameters or some conditions it does, and for others it does not. Okay? And it turns out that, it, that monode growth does imply logistic, but only if the starting resource concentration, so the initial concentration of the sugar, for example, uh, is kind of less than, and ideally much less than, uh, the monode constant. Right, because in, it's in this situation where you, if, if, if the R, the resource concentration, is always much less than Km, then you just have a linear dependence between the resource concentration and the per capita growth rate. And that's great because what you see here is that there's a direct linear relationship between the population size and the resource concentration. So if we start with a small population size, right, as the population is growing, it's using up the resource, and you get a direct linear relationship here. And then if this is also linear, then you get, oh, I erased it, then you get this Logi these logistic kind of curves. Right, so, for example, we might plot the normalized gamma. So that's the per capita growth rate normalized by the maximum growth rate that it could have. Um, and also the normalized n, right, so the population size relative to where that population is going to go. And you, what you see, what you end up getting is that these curves are essentially linear if R0 is kind of, well, less than or much less than kappa m. And then they kind of go more like this. Right, so as this might be, this is R0, I don't know, maybe 6 times kappa m. Just to give you, give you a sense of kind of how curved these things are. Right. So what, what you get is, um, and, and in some ways this, this makes sense, because let's say you start out with a lot of sugar. So the population starts growing exponentially. All right, it's more or less flat for a long, long time. And then, and the, the resource is being used up, but if the starting resource concentration is way above, the, and just we should plot where kappa m is here. So this kappa, here's a kappa m. The starting resource concentration is way up here. Then even though the resource is being used up, it's not affecting the growth of the population. And it's only kind of at the very, very end where the resource kind of gets used up, right? And that's what's happening here, is that if you start with a lot of the resource, then it suddenly goes to, uh, the per capita growth rate suddenly goes to zero. Yes? All right, so your question is, okay, about the R max here, and if the resource So as the resource is going to infinity, yep. why is it tapering to that R max thing? Why does it go to the R max? Yeah, I mean, why oh. is there a bound on the... Right, so you're wondering kind of biologically, why would this happen? Right, so th the idea is that eventually uh, the, that resource is not limiting anymore and that something else is limiting. And right, so it's just, uh, and you could imagine maybe a simple model for the cell is that, it's, um, that there's, it takes some time to replicate the DNA, and then, but then in it, to make a new cell, not only do you need to replicate the DNA, but you have to import enough resources to, uh, to do something else, to make the cell wall, for example. Right? So then the total time that it's going to take you to, uh, to divide is going to be a combination of the time that it takes you to get this resource in um, plus the time it takes you to do something else. Right? So it's really just that uh, it's saying that, it, that uh, for l very large resource concentrations, then um, you're it's, it's no, maybe no longer the, the thing that's limiting, or it's just that there's some maximum rate that you can uptake the resource. Right? I mean, you can think about it in different ways. But it's just that, um, and things don't go to infinity, I guess is maybe the statement, right? So it, there has to be something that causes it to, uh, to flatten out. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so the reason that I, I brought, bring this up is just because I, I think it's nice to be able to model any given phenomenon in, um, in a couple different ways. All right, so this, these are simple models for population growth. Here, again, purely phenomenological, where all we're thinking about is the population size. Whereas over here, you might say, all right, now we're including one other thing, say a resource concentration. Okay. And, you know, and then here you could also ask, oh, do, you know, is, might it be possible for this to oscillate? You, know, you could ask other questions, but and each of these different kind of modeling perspectives might give you kind of different insights or get you to ask different questions or go make different measurements in the lab. And it's not to say that one of them is better uh, than the other one. They can each fail in different ways, but uh, in many cases, I would argue that it's good to use, say, multiple different modeling approaches, even on one system, just because it does, uh, it does end up leading to different insights. Are there any questions about where we are right now before we move on? I, uh, I, so, so far, we've been thinking about purely uh, competitive kind of interactions, right? Because in all of these cases, other individuals in the population are always, um, are always harming you in some way. Uh, whereas, uh, what, uh, there are many contexts in which uh, populations, at least over some range of densities, they benefit uh, from uh, other individuals in the population. So we want to think about some kind of cooperative growth now. Uh, yeah, question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, so yeah, so the question was, so here we've made an assumption, right? Uh, and the assumption that you're pointing out is that we're, we're assuming that the only time that the resource is being used is when the cells are dividing, right? Whereas uh, in reality, as you're pointing out, even, let's say that if we, if we limit the population due to some, something else, Right, so it stops growing, there still is maybe some maintenance, some low maintenance cost, where they're going to use the resource even, um, even when they're not dividing. Right? And I, I don't disagree with your biological statement, and the question is just, uh, but there, there are many, many things that are true that have been neglected here. Right? And so we, then the question is, which things uh, do, would you want to include as kind of the, your zeroth order model? And then again, which phenomena are you trying to study, and then which things do you have to include in your model? So this is certainly not, this is, it, it's, there's one, it's one more level of detail relative to this, but it's certainly, it's not incorporating uh, many things. And, and what, you, what you're pointing out is, I think, one of them. Yeah. Uh, and I think that this one, I think, is interesting, especially because it can lead to, um, to an effective delay of some sort or another that can lead to, to rich dynamics. One of the things that we're studying in my group is the, um, the changes in the media that are associated with growth. For example, uh, there are many, uh, many microbes, when they, uh, when they grow, they either acidify or alkalize the environment. And, uh, and indeed, what we see are many cases in which uh, these changes in the pH are so dramatic that it can actually lead to uh, kind of a collapse or extinction of the population. And to get that kind of effect, you, 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 can't, you can't capture it by simple models like this because you need some sort of delay or some kind of you know, that you need some way in which, even when the cells stop dividing, they continue to metabolize and, say, continue to acidify the environment. And we can measure this. Right? So, uh, indeed, so these things can be very important. And then it, it depends on your system. Uh, yeah, you have a follow-up. Yeah. So, uh, maybe a comment about something else also. So, it just, here again, it depends on the increase in numbers. Yeah. But what if cells are dividing and dying? So, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think R doesn't capture that anyway. But That's right. So, here, uh, we have not in included... Uh, any death, even though here, in, when we first talked about the exponential growth, I said that that maybe R could be composed of some birth rates and death rates. I might have said that. Um, yeah, but it, at least, at least in here, we're not we're not assuming that there's any death at all, right? And that, yeah, that that could be very important. Um, I, in in many conditions, I think you can uh, neglect uh, during the, for example, just growth of E. coli in Luria broth. I think you over the first. 48 hours, I think you can neglect cell death. You know, and the que so the question is just, you know, which, which system are you studying, over what time scales, and yeah. 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 Right.
Yeah, okay, so the, qu the question is basically, if you go and you make measurements of these microorganisms like E. coli, um, how good are these, uh, you know, and, um, and I think it depends on what you're asking about, yeah. So depending on the species and the environment, what we see is that some really do saturate essentially linearly, like a logistic curve. Uh, others, they really do look much more like this, right, where they, there's no significant decrease in the growth rate, and then, and then it kind of plummets as it reaches carrying capacity. So different species, depending on the environment, really do look different here. The other thing that I think is important to note is that sometimes, for example, if you, if you look at these curves for budding yeast growing in a simple sugar like glucose or galactose, these things really can look quite linear, despite the fact that the concentration is not actually less than this kappa M. Right, so this is, but then this is saying that there's something else that's limiting the growth, and you know, and so it could be maybe ethanol, you know. But I think this also highlights that um, it, it, by by being concrete about your assumptions, you can maybe make concrete predictions. But then you can say, oh, well, this is not, it's either working or not working, and then you can go look to see which assumption it was that um, that was violated. Um, but I, you know, I, I would say basically for microorganisms, uh, we see curves that are either pretty linear or, um, but we don't really see things that are concave up, you know, the things we see tend to be concave down, but, yeah. Oh, um, I would say E. coli is, I, I wouldn't say so, yeah. uh, but, um, yeah, and then the question is, things that, no, yeah, what, what, what's worth, um, yeah, most of the growth curves that many of us are thinking about are in complex media that has many, many, many different resources, right, so then I think you, then you, uh, in order to make sure that you're comparing kind of apples to oranges, even in the context of modeling, then you want to do you know minimal media with um, with glucose. You know, and I can't say that I've really paid, you know we haven't really done so many measurements with E. coli. We, we do some, but uh, we haven't worried about it too much. So I, yeah, I um, yeah, I would be hesitant to say maybe too much about it. Yeah. So with respect to the nutrients, I can appreciate the model, but if something like temperature comes in, how would you model that? Like what yeah. parameter would it be? Okay, yeah, so the question is basically uh, with temperature, how, how would you want to model that? Um, and I think that that, yeah, temperature is basically varying this maximal growth rate. I would say like here, this either R max, if you wanted to do a resource explicit model, or this R. Uh, it turns out that if you look at uh, the growth rates of different microorganisms, as a function of temperature. Uh, so this is the experimentally measured gamma. Uh, and yeah, if, if you do this on a, I guess, maybe you want to do it on a log scale, because yeah, what, what you see is that the, the growth rate of microorganisms as a function of temperature over a, a fair range of conditions actually looks an awful lot like generic, um, the, the rates of chemical reactions. All right, so there's this rule of thumb in, chem in chemistry where they tell you that for every 10 degrees Celsius increase in temperature, you, you get a 2x increase in, uh, in the rate, right? And that depends on the, you know, the, like the height or the energy barrier, da, da, da. so it's not like, a, it's not a rigorous, rigorous thing, but again, it's a rule of thumb. This thing basically works uh, for microorganisms as well uh, uh, for a range of temperatures. So if you look at, this is, for example, then the log of the growth rate or on a log scale, as you like, as a function of the temperature, uh, right? It kind of, it has kind of this rule until it gets to its optimum, and then it falls off pretty dramatically. Right, so for example, E. coli, this might be, um, you know, at 30, you know, 9 degrees Celsius, say. Right, that there's, that's the maximum growth rate of the organism. And then um, below it, it really just follows kind of this simple rule that's like enzyme kinetics. And you might just say, oh, well, the cell is a big bag of enzymes, and so everything is kind of slowing down in the same way, and so then it leads to, you know, um, but then, you know, above it, you know, things start denaturing, falling apart, and then you get uh, a dramatic decrease. And different organisms uh, have different growth rates and different optimal temperatures, but in this range, they behave kind of similarly. So a different, like a thermophile, might look like, so this is here, E. coli, and this is a thermophile, so an organism that likes high temperatures. And what you see is that it has kind of a similar slope down here, different optimal temperatures and different growth rates, right? but, uh, but it, it's affected by, they're affected by temperature in broadly similar ways. Okay. 
Um, all right, so what I want to do now is think a little bit about, uh, about cooperative growth and the qualitatively different or interesting things that can happen. Uh, and I, I think maybe before even writing down any equations, it's useful to just think about what are the uh, kind of situations where this might happen, right? Uh, so first of all, in the context of like, macro organisms like animals, uh, we, uh, there, there are many different effects that can lead to some kind of cooperative growth. Something that is known as the Alley effect, normally in ecology, where the key, the key thing is that for the Alley effect, if you look at the per capita growth rate as a function of the population size, over some range of population sizes, in particular for small populations, initially this thing goes up. Right? So the alley effect is saying that initially individuals benefit from other individuals in the population. Eventually it has to curve over because you, know, you can always get a large enough population size that that's going to inhibit growth. But the alley effect is saying that over some range, this is, you get a positive slope. Right, so for animals, this can happen for many reasons. Uh, you can have, uh, say, uh, group defense, like schooling or herding behaviors. You can have group hunting behaviors, so like the way that a, like a wolf pack can take down a large animal. Right? So you need some number of uh, animals in order to do that kind of hunting. You, uh, and, and just generically, uh, animals need to find mates. So below some density, they can't find mates, and that's going to cause problems for the population. Right? So, the alley effect was originally studied in the context of uh, macroorganisms, but it turns out at the, at the micro scale, it's also quite common. Right. All right, so microbes have many different effects that can lead to this. Uh, one common uh, origin of these effects is um, collective uh, degradation of uh, complex sugars. So uh, collective uh, breakdown of sugars, and I'll, I'll say something about more about this later. Uh, collective breakdown of sugars or nutrients. Uh, other kinds of things uh, that could lead to this would be uh, kind of quorum sensing type behaviors, where they are communicating with each other and engaging in some collective task only when they reach some quorum or some density. Uh, there could also be uh, maybe uh, collective uh, release of toxins to fight off opponents, or many, many different possible origins for uh, these kinds of uh, alley effects or cooperative kind of dynamics. Right. Now, there are many, many different models that you could write down. We're going to just look at one of them where we have something that looks at first pretty similar. So we have an RN term, but then we want So this is kind of a simple phenomenological model that is capturing some kind of cooperative growth dynamic. Right. When n reaches k, again, the population is going to stop growing. The key thing here with this term, and, and so in some ways this is the, this, a key term, where this can capture the idea that maybe there's a critical population size below which the population is going to go extinct. So for example, we could plot this gamma for this model, and here's zero, this is n, and it can look like the following. All right, so this is going to be a quadratic, where here is nc, and here is k. Key thing here is that in between nc and k, per capita growth rate is positive. That's saying that the population is going to move up in size until it reaches k, and then here it would go down. Now, but the key thing here is that below, if, you, if the population starts out below this nc, then the per capita growth rate is negative. It comes over here. So what we have is, uh, this is a case where the population size is bistable. Right? The population has to get above this size or density in order to survive at all. Okay? So this, this is a situation that leads to bistability. Um, 
And it, it indeed has this alley effect. As you can see, there's positive slope here. Right? So there's some range where the population is benefiting from the rest. This, this is what happens when, um, when NC is greater than zero. You could also have a model where NC is less than zero, and then it would, it would kind of look like this. Right, and this here is what you would call a weak alley effect. Okay, so down here, this is a strong alley effect, and this is a weak alley effect. By weak, what we're saying is, all right, so there is a positive slope. So in, for this dashed line, the population is benefiting from other individuals in the population. But for the weak alley effect, what you can see is that there's no minimal size required for survival. Right, the pop, a single individual in principle could grow up to reach carrying capacity. Yeah, right, that's right. Okay, so it's bistable because, so for a str the strong alley effect, we have n equal to zero is a stable state, and n equal to k is a stable state. n sub c is, a, is an unstable fixed point, but, uh, but you have two, two stable ones on either side. Yeah, thanks. Okay, does this make sense? All right, so this is, uh, this is a simple phenomenological model. Um, and now what we want to do is just think about what's going to happen for a logistically growing population, or for a cooperatively growing population in deteriorating environments. So what we're going to do is uh, think about deterioration as being something where we add a death rate, delta. Okay? So this is, this is a way of thinking about deterioration. Okay. Now we're adding some mortality rate. Um, and for, uh, for a, logistic, a logistic population, it would look like this. Yes. Yeah, so uh, for cooperation, shouldn't I think of a local environment? Because the way this is modeled, is it like uh, it's a global constraint for cooperation, yeah. right? right so, what, so shouldn't one look at something like a local density? This like a, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Global... Right, so yeah, so the, here what we're doing is we're assuming that we're operating in kind of the well-mixed regime. Right, so there's no, we don't need to worry about space at all. Um, but, um, and, and that, that, that you can think about that as a, a microorganism in the lab where we're shaking. Right, so in that case, all that matters is the density, because there's no spatial structure. There's no sense in which two individuals can actually um, be next to each other for any significant length of time. Of course, you always have local density, but the question is, what's the time scale over which the local density is doing something? And the relevant time scale is the generation time. So if everything is getting mixed up over time scales that are much shorter than that, then, uh, then you can think of it as being well mixed. Yeah. But, um, but in a spatially structured environment, you get you can get much more interesting things yeah and so a lot of what we do is you know we think about spatial uh, like population waves or pattern formation and you know but for now we're just thinking about well mixed populations yeah. uh, okay so uh right so this is cooperative growth and all right so this is logistic and down here is cooperative all right so logistic we still have rn one minus n over k but we're still going to add a minus delta n all right so in both cases we can think about what happens as we add uh, some environmental deterioration. Um, and in particular, one thing that we'd like to know is, well, how is it, you know, eventually the population is going to go extinct, right? If we add enough mortality, enough death to the population, then it, the population should die. Uh, now, the question we'd like to know is, well, in what manner does the population die? All right, so what I'm plotting now is the... Um, the net per capita growth rate as a function of the population size. Um, and this is for uh, a logistic population. Yes, question? Oh, the question is why are we adding a linear death term, right? Um, and uh, this is by choice, right? So we could do other things. And indeed, uh, you can get qualitatively different phenomena depending upon uh, how, how you add that. But I think that um, a per capita death is maybe 
a parsimonious choice because a wide range of different things that you, if you add antibiotics or you go to high temperature, or you do this or that, what you're doing is you're, you're introducing, you know, some fraction of the population will die. And that, that would be, that's captured by a per capita growth rate. Or sorry, a per capita death rate. Uh, yeah, so I think that this is maybe the, the simplest assumption to make, but it does, it's not the only one. Yeah. All right, so for logistic, we maybe start out with something that looks like this. But as we add this delta, this mortality, what we get is the curve coming down. And this is if we add a death rate delta, right? So the, de the delta just pulls the curves down. Right? And what you can see then is that as we go to larger and larger death rate, the equilibrium size of the population just decreases. Right? And we can plot then, and this is what's known as a bifurcation diagram. What we can do is we can plot the, um, the equilibrium population size as a function of the delta that we add. Right, so if, if delta is equal to zero, what should, what's the equilibrium population size? K, right, good. Okay, so we start at K. All right, it turns out this is gonna decrease linearly until at some delta we get population extinction. And what's, where is it gonna cross here? I don't have my notes here, so I need help. Um, you know, what's the mortality that is going to cause this population to go extinct? R. Okay, great. Indeed. I guess R is the maximal possible growth rate of the population. All right, so once the delta becomes equal to R, that's when the population is going to go extinct. Right, and you can you know, rearrange the equations and see it, but, um, right. And so what's going on here is that, I mean, this, this looks very similar, obviously, but there are different axes labels, so be careful, right? What's happening is that the stable size of the population is decreasing in a smooth way until you get extinction. And it's important to note that down here, there's an unstable fixed point denoted by a dashed line, right? Because for any death rate below R, you can add small population and it'll come up to the stable size. Right, so looks like that. This is what's known as a transcritical bifurcation. Right, and what happens here is that now this, oh sorry, th this one is now the stable, stable state. Right. So what happened was that there was an exchanging of stabilities between these two fixed points. Doesn't matter. The key thing is that there was a smooth extinction. Right. What about this case of the alley effect? Okay. So what we can do is we can imagine that we're starting with a weak alley effect. It looks like this. Okay. Now, what happens as we, um, as we add a mortality? Well, again, we pull this curve down. Right? If we pull it down like this, what you see is now we've generated a strong alley effect. Okay, so we started out where it was monostable. Right, so there was still cooperative growth, but a single individual could in principle grow up to the carrying capacity. But as the environment deteriorates, we pull this curve down. Now it becomes bistable. And we can ask, well, what happens as we go further? Right, so this, this uh, population size is shrinking. But eventually what you see is that the equilibrium size of the population reaches this value here, and all of a sudden the population is going to collapse. Right? So here we don't get a smooth decrease in the size of the population. So, oh, sorry, this is not n, this is delta n. All right, so what's going to happen is that it looks like this. I want to make sure that I do the right thing. Given how I've drawn it, this goes All 
right? Because at no, we start out with a weak alley effect, we assumed, right? So that means that it, without any added mortality, it was monostable. At some point, you get bi-stability, right? Um, and so here, it was unstable, and this is all stable. And the key thing here is that there's sudden collapse of the population. Right. At the environment's deteriorating in kind of a slow way. The size of the population is shrinking. And what's interesting is that once you get to this value of the mortality, you get a sudden collapse of the population. Right? So you go from finite population size to extinction. Right? So a small change in the environment, a small change in the mortality, leads to a dramatic collapse of the population. And, yeah. Right, so the question is, um, when we got the bi-stability, the other population, the other stable, um, well, so we've assumed that we started out up um, in this weak alley effect regime, right? So when we started out, zero was a fixed point, but it was unstable, right? So it starts out with a, as a dashed line. When we pull it down just so that the line crosses here, then that's when we get, uh, and this is again, this is a, another trend, this is actually then a transcritical bifurcation again. Yeah. Uh, yes, right, yeah, so in a, I should get more colors of chalk or something, yeah, because down this whole, um, beyond this point, this is all a stable fixed point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, just to make me feel bad. All right, uh, all right. Well, I'll, for tomorrow, I'll, I'll make you so. Yeah. So yeah, the, the, it was it's dashed over here and solid here, so unstable and then stable. Okay. Um, okay. All right. And this point here is what's known as a fold bifurcation. Uh, and, and that's because those fixed points kind of fold over on each other. And this is the basic mechanism that is thought to lead to sudden transitions uh, in a wide variety of different systems. Uh, in my group, uh, we, over the last five years, have thought about this a lot in the context of population dynamics. But uh, this is the basic thing that is thought to uh, lead to sudden transitions in many other systems as well. Are there any questions about, uh, about where we are? So uh, I, I put together a 15-minute PowerPoint presentation, uh, and then uh, we should still have some time for questions. Um, now could we lower the? Oh, it's our yeah. Well. Right. So, uh, so as I said, uh, some uh, thread of work within my group over the last five years has been exploring uh, these kinds of ideas experimentally. So as I said, I'm an experimental physicist. What that means in my case is that I like to consume the research of theorists and try to figure out what I think I can actually measure in the lab. Okay. Uh, all right, so yeah, just as, as a reminder, there are many, many cases in which uh, populations benefit from, uh, from having individuals in the population. All right, so I gave some examples before, uh, but one uh, set of classic examples that people talk about is the schooling of fish. And so the idea is that this is likely, in many cases, thought to be uh, some sort of anti-predation device. But of course, if you want to form an effective school, then, uh, then you need to have fish to do it, right? Single fish is not going to form a school, right? Uh, and this is, this is relevant because uh, if you're not forming an effective school, you may get uh, consumed uh, by some sort of predators. One thing that's interesting about these contexts is that, as I mentioned, not only uh, can you have cooperative effects associated with uh, group defense, but you also have cooperative effects associated with group hunting. Right? So there are all these uh, amazing movies of dolphins where when they're, when they're fishing, they, uh, they take turns feeding, right? So some groups of the dolphins actually corral the fish into one location, and then they, have, they, they do these bubbles, and they, they kind of trap the fish, and then they take turns, uh, different, uh, different individual actually feeding. Right? So clearly an example of, of a collective or cooperative group hunting type strategy. Now, 
given the fact that you can have these cooperative effects in fish populations and in others, uh, then it's thought that this is the basic mechanism that is leading to a sudden collapse of these populations. And indeed, uh, I don't know if there's uh, much uh, work on this around here, but at least in fisheries in the United States, there, uh, it's thought that many of them have collapsed kind of catastrophically. Right? So this is, uh, this is data from the Monterey sardine fishery. Right? So this is a um, uh, small fish off the coast of California, where uh, what you can see is that the number of fish that were caught and consumed uh, increased dramatically, in particular uh, during the time of World War II. And this uh, massive fishing uh, during the war led to a collapse of the sardine fishery. Right? Almost uh, no fish have been available, were available for decades after that. Right? And uh, it's thought that this, is ba that this is because of the deteriorating environment from increased fishing pressures, together with the cooperative kind of growth dynamics within the fish population. Um, so here in the next 10 minutes, what I want to uh, tell you a little bit is how uh, some more ideas from uh, this bifurcation theory can provide insight into these tipping points. And in particular, there are suggestions that there may be universal early warning indicators that these uh, tipping points or the bifurcations are approaching. Uh, the proposal is that there should be a change in the fluctuations of the population approaching these tipping points. Uh, and what, uh, one, what we've been doing in my group is uh, trying to measure this uh, in well-controlled uh, experiments. All right, so just as a reminder of the way we're thinking about this, if you think about the size of the population as a function of the environmental conditions, what can happen is that as the environment deteriorates, the size of the population shrinks in a modest way until at some critical level of the environment, there's a catastrophic collapse of that population. It could be local extinction or a transition to some other, for now, we'll say, undesirable state. Now, after that occurs, what you might think is that you could just um, you could just improve the environment, just you know, decrease your fishing pressure or whatnot, and get recovery. But it may not be so simple, because it could be that you have to come all the way over here to this point on the left before the population can recover to the healthy state. Right? And so the reason that this is happening is because at intermediate environmental conditions, the system is bistable. So there are two possible stable states. There's the healthy one up here and the unhealthy one down here. Right? Generically, what you expect is that these two stable states should be separated by this unstable fixed point. It's telling us about the minimal density required for survival of that population or to go to the healthy state. If you start out above it, then you'll go to the healthy. Below it, you come to the unhealthy one. Okay. So what you would like in, the, in this situation is to have some way to know that you're approaching that tipping point or the bifurcation before you cross it. Because after you cross it, uh, it can be very difficult to get recovery because there can be memory or hysteresis in the system. All right, so what's interesting is that at least in principle, there are universal behaviors of these compact, complex systems as you approach the bifurcation. All right, to get an idea of why that might be, what we can do is we can take uh, this bifurcation diagram, we can take two slices, one green far from the tipping point and red when we're close to it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the effective potential describing the dynamics of the system uh, at these two points. All right, so what we're going to do is now rotate it to look at the population. It's going to be population size on the x-axis and the effective potential on the y-axis. All right, so here, this green state is when you're far from the tipping point. And what you can see is that there's a very nice, deep potential well telling you about how the population size is going to um, respond to perturbations. Right, so any perturbation away from equilibrium is going to quickly go away. In addition, there's a really big basin of attraction. It would require a really large negative perturbation to push the population beyond that unstable state, to push it to the, um, to the state that leads to extinction. Uh, however, as we get close to the bifurcation, the system looks very different. Because now what you can see is the effective potential has changed. It's now very uh, kind of broad and weak. This is saying that a perturbation away from equilibrium will quickly, or sorry, is going to only slowly come back to equilibrium. And what that is telling you is that even just the natural kind of demographic fluctuations of the system can kind of build up. And you might expect to get a, an increase in the size of the fluctuations of the system. In addition to that, you can see that the basin of attraction has actually shrunk. Right? So you don't have to hit the system as hard. 
in order to get it to transition to that, another, that other unhealthy state. All right, so this is kind of, in words, capturing the general mathematical expectation, which is that this uh, fold bifurcation is what's known as a zero eigenvalue bifurcation. In particular, that the dominant eigenvalue describing the dynamics of the system goes to zero at any fold bifurcation. Right? So we, we wrote out a particular model over here that it, it was a, is a fine phenomenological model, but the mathematical statement is that independent of what model you write down, so long as it has a fold bifurcation, the eigenvalue describing the dynamics is going to go to zero. So it's something uh, that's known as critical slowing down. And if all that talk of eigenvalues is uh, mystifying to you, I'm going to summarize what the expectations are from theory. Okay. What you expect is that there's a loss of resilience to perturbations as you get close to the tipping point, but that loss of resilience should be accompanied by some, in principle, universal uh, changes in the behavior of the system. The expectation is that you should get an increase in the recovery time following a perturbation, and second, the fluctuations in the system, in this case, the fluctuations in the size of the population, should get both larger and slower. All right, so from my standpoint, yes? Do you mean the same as the critical point in thermodynamics? Or? Yeah, so the, right, so the question is the relationship between the tipping point and, and, um, and critical points in, in you know, kind of classical systems. And so they're, they're definitely related, but not quite the same thing, because... This is, uh, I'd say, more of like a first-order phase transition because uh, there's a, a discrete uh, jump in the state of the system, whereas most of the critical phenomena dynamics that were studied are actually closer to, the, um, to a transcritical bifurcation because the state of the system kind of moves uh, smoothly, although the eigenvalue still goes to zero in a, um, in a transcritical bifurcation. Uh, yeah, so in that, in that sense, it's, um, I guess it's related but not quite the same thing. Okay, so but from uh, from our perspective as experimentalists is that uh, we uh, we like all of these ideas these predictions from theory, uh, but we're interested in whether they can actually be measured. Right? So this is work uh, that was done by a, a student of mine and a um, as well as a visiting student, uh, and what what they decided to do is use just laboratory budding yeast populations uh, to try to study these effects. I told you that these cooperative growth dynamics take place not only in macroorganisms but also at the micro scale. Uh, in our case, we're using uh, budding yeast that are collectively breaking down the sugar sucrose. Okay. And I'll just mention that from a general philosophical point, uh, we view our group as kind of being at this interface between uh, mathematical uh, modeling and the complex dynamics that are present within, uh, say, natural kind of populations or communities, where uh, we, we hope that by uh, performing quantitative measurements in the lab, we can uh, tell we can maybe say something to the people studying complex communities about the kinds of phenomena that may be present, as well as maybe saying something to the, uh, to the theorists about which assumptions or which models are more relevant for some real populations. Okay, um, okay so uh, what we're doing is we're growing our yeast in well-mixed liquid culture on uh, the sugar sucrose, where the yeast, they break down the sugar by secreting an enzyme outside of the cell that breaks down the sugar. Okay. All right, so this, uh, it, what we're doing is growing the yeast on the sugar sucrose. It's common table sugar. All right, it's a disaccharide that needs to be broken down in order to be consumed. Okay. We can actually measure explicitly that there is an alley effect because we can just measure that the yeast divide higher at higher cell density, at least over some range of densities. Eventually, they run out of resources, but over some range of densities, they benefit from other yeast in the population. And it's that dynamic that leads to the possibility of a sudden collapse. All right, we're growing our yeast in, in very simple conditions. It's just well-mixed batch culture. We start with some density of cells. We shake or let them divide over the course of a day. They're breaking down the sucrose, eating the simple sugars. At the end of the day, we can measure the population size just by looking to see how cloudy the liquid is. Then uh, we're doing the standard daily batch dilution that micro, uh, my, uh, microbiologists have done for many years, where you just transfer a small fraction of the cells into fresh liquid with fresh nutrients and fresh everything else, uh, and we let this go for a week or two. Okay? What we want to do then is just look to see how the population size varies as a function of time. Uh, we'll start by looking at dilution of 1,400. So only one in 1,400 of the cells present at the end of the day are going to be propagated on. All right, so this is really a controlled mortality rate. 
So the first thing we wanted to ask is, uh, do yeast growing on the sugar of sucrose, do they display bistability depending upon the starting density of cells in the population? And this is a very difficult experiment to do with fisheries, but it's very easy to do in the lab. Okay? What we did is we just started many different densities of cells and then just propagated them as a function of time and then just looked to see how does the population size or density change over time. What you can see is that if we start with a high density of cells, those populations, they all survive. They reach some stable equilibrium density. Whereas the populations that start at low density, they shrink over time. And they eventually go extinct. That's another stable state. In between the two stable states, you expect to have an unstable fixed point. And indeed, you can actually just see explicitly where that is. Those eight populations are kind of, they're started at the top of that effective potential. So just half of those populations kind of fall on one side, half fall on the other. You can see that some of them look like they're going to survive. Some of them look like they're going extinct. Yes? So uh, yeast is just a proxy. Like you could have used E. coli or something else. Yeah, we could have used anything. That's right. That's and we've, me we've measured these uh, kind of bifurcation and growth dynamics with a number of different microorganisms and a number of different environments. And yeah, it's not, the key thing is there has to be some cooperative effect. Yeah, so the delta is basically like, you can think of it as the log of a dilution factor. Yeah. Right. Okay, so right, so this population is bistable. All right, that's, that's good. So what we can do is we can then, uh, on this plot, we can look at the population density as a function of the dilution factor, and we can just put the location of the stable size of the population. And here, this unstable fixed point, that was the minimal density required for survival of the population. But... When we started these experiments, what we wanted to know is, uh, w was there a fold bifurcation that would lead to catastrophic collapse of the population? And then, if so, can we measure uh, these predicted signatures of critical slowing down? Okay. To get to that, what we did is we just repeated the previous experiment, but for many different dilution factors. Right, so we took different populations, put them in different environments, and then just looked to see what's the equilibrium size of the population and what's the minimal size required for, su for survival. And uh, when Lay and Don did that experiment, what they got is, uh, is what I think is really a beautiful fold bifurcation describing how yeast grow in this sugar. And it has the basic features that you would have expected. The size of the population kind of shrinks as the environment deteriorates, whereas the minimal viable density for survival, that grows as the environment deteriorates. And indeed, it's when the minimal viable density for survival becomes equal to the equilibrium density that you get that fold bifurcation, because those fixed points, they collide and annihilate. And that's where you get this catastrophic collapse, and you're going to get extinction. Now, we were really interested in these experiments because we wanted to measure the fluctuations in the size of the population. And we mapped out this bifurcation diagram because we, you, know, you need to know where you are in order to start measuring things like fluctuations. But when we went to go uh, write our paper, we went to try to find and just to cite all the other people that had mapped out the, their bifurcation. And as far as we can tell, just nobody had ever done that. Okay? And that, I think this highlights that in the field of a kind of you know, population dynamics, it's just very hard to make these sorts of measurements. So what people do instead is they write down a model that has, say, a fold bifurcation and take that as evidence that their system has a fold bifurcation. But you know, you can always write down a model that does something, right? And the question is whether it's actually there in your system, right? And so this, I think, is just highlighting that there's, I think, a lot of value in taking um, kind of a first principle um, experimental approach in simple systems where you can really uh, explicitly show that you know what's going on. And then you can approach the bifurcation and measure things like fluctuations. Okay? Um, all right, so, so the question is, well, what, what do they look like? Yes. Oh, yeah, the hysteresis. Well, this, this is hysteretic, actually. Uh, and, yeah, we have five minutes. Is that all right? Ten minutes? Okay, well, perfect. Um, yeah, so there is hysteresis here, because what you can see is that here it's stable, here it's stable. So if you collapse and you come back, that you're still dead. Yeah, uh, the stable state here is at zero. We could add some, say, migration to, br to pull that off of zero if you want. But, um, yeah, here it's, it still is hysteretic, still is uh, bistable here, but the stable state is at zero. So there's a, it's actual extinction here. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, the question now is, can we actually measure um, the, uh, a change in the fluctuations of the population as we approach the bifurcation? Right. So uh, what I'm uh, sh uh, plotting here is uh, just the 
magnitude of the fluctuations uh, as a function of uh, the mortality that we're imposing. Yeah. Sort of showed here were deterministic. So how do you model the fluctuations? Yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a good question. The question is how were we modeling the fluctuations? Um, and the answer is that we could do it in a variety of different ways. Uh, the dominant source of noise in our system is um, okay. Well, maybe there are a few things to say. First of all, um, these this is all experimental data. So I actually haven't told you anything about models. And indeed, all of the effects that we're talking about are independent of the model that we use because they're universal behaviors, which is why we're interested in them. Um, but of course, we have a model, <laughs> and the model, you know, and and and, and, and as I as I advocated for at the beginning, we have multiple different models, and they, you know, and they they kind of they all work. Uh, the 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 standard thing that we we do here though is um, the dominant source of noise in our system is not a root end demographic kind of noise, but is actually more of a linear end noise. Uh, so what we typically do is we assume that we get uh, a linear end uh, kind of noise each cycle. So you know, there's really we put in say five percent uh, error or noise in n each cycle, and then and then propagate it. But uh, how you do it actually doesn't matter because the critical slowing down will amplify whatever noise is in the system. Uh, right, and so what you can see is that uh, in benign conditions, uh, the fluctuations in the size of the population is only a couple percent, two, three percent. Okay. Um, however, as we approach the bifurcation, we get really a, a dramatic increase in the size of the fluctuations. Right, here, it's getting to be 20, uh, roughly 20 percent uh, size of the fluctuations. Right? So this is telling you that, in principle, you could use the size of the fluctuations as some sort of early warning indicator that you're approaching the bifurcation. So in principle, you could you could save the population. You could sound the alarm. Uh, when you, you, of course, you have to have you have to have some sense of uh, what when to do it. Here, you might say, oh, 10 percent, right? Uh, so there's not a principled way of defining the threshold. It has to be relative to whatever normal fluctuations are. Okay. Uh, all right. So indeed, here we can see an increase in the size of the fluctuations. Uh, what about a change in the time scale of the fluctuations? Well, to get to that, what we can do is we can measure the autocorrelation time. It's telling us how correlated the size of the population is one day relative to the previous day. In, um, in benign conditions, the fluctuations, the typical time scale is just a couple days. But again, as we approach the bifurcation, we see that the fluctuations, not only are they getting bigger, but they're also getting slower. Right? This is the other behavior that was predicted by critical slowing down. Yes, question. Probably a naive question, but uh, do we know that the coefficient of variation is not dependent on the experimental error we are making no, during no. the experiment? And this, is, and this is a very important question. The question is, uh, how can we know that the coefficient of variation is not, a, is not determined by, um, by the experimental error, right? Um, and, and there are many things that we can do. So we, um, well, we can, me we can measure it in different environments, show that it doesn't happen in different environments. We can measure our error as a function of n. We can... Uh, well, we, yeah, we, so we can do um, many, many different things. Uh, we also can measure it uh, not only by looking at optical density, but also by counting cells, by flow cytometry, where the error is... Yeah. And actually, the error of all these measurements is tiny, uh, in the sense that, uh, yeah, so I would say it's really... Although, when I say it's really... I'd say 2% is actually maybe, like, our experimental error. So in that sense, and that's true throughout this entire range. So here, I think the fluctuations are, are actually... Uh, dominated by, me by measurement error, uh, but the, uh, our fractional error is, is really the same over this entire range. Uh, um, yeah, but it's, you know, it's important, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're, uh, we're out of time, which is perfect, because uh, I have my summary slide. All right, so, uh, so first, yeah, uh, when you have populations that are growing cooperatively, that can be good in allowing the population to survive in some environment, but it can also lead to a sudden or catastrophic collapse of the population in deteriorating environments. That, uh, that sort of tipping point, uh, although sudden, it may be possible to anticipate that it's approaching based on looking at some of these behaviors like the fluctuations of the population. I didn't show you, but we also measured all these other behaviors that are predicted by critical slowing down. We also measured the increase just in time to recover from a perturbation, a defined perturbation. Uh, we also uh, measured a decre uh, decrease in the resilience of the population, the ability of the population to withstand perturbations. Um, in later work, we've also demonstrated that there's uh, characteristic spatial patterns that emerge as you approach uh, the bifurcation. So this is, uh, this is, well, there's a whole stream of work that we've, we've done, but that I didn't have time to tell you about. Uh, but more generally, I think uh, my group is just very excited about this idea that 
Uh, these kind of experimentally tractable laboratory microcosms represent a, a unique way to probe the emergent dynamics uh, present within uh, populations. Uh, with that, I will thank the group, who are the ones that have actually been doing the work. Um, and uh, if there's any time, I'll take more questions. Thanks. I just have a question about uh, how you use the word cooperative because uh, in the experiment that you described, uh, the yeast are sort of growing in this culture where the environmental conditions are sort of deteriorating over time or are you mm. keeping the environmental conditions fixed? Okay, so yeah, um, in each tube, we're always transferring the cells into the same environment. So when, when, when I say deteriorating environment, I, I really have a, a bunch of different um, populations that are in different environments. Okay, so, there, okay. so then in that sense, there's no, each individual population is not experiencing a deterioration. Uh, we have other experiments where we did do a slow deterioration, we can also see that. Yeah, so, but yeah, in, the, in this data, it was each population is experiencing a constant environment. Um, and the, the use of the word cooperative is really just because uh, these yeast, they benefit from other yeast in the population because if the other yeast break down the sucrose, I can eat it. All right, so in that sense, it's, 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 if you'd like, it's like a collective hunting uh, yeah, no, because I'm just trying to differentiate this from the case where, let's say you take yeast out of the fridge and then you put them, you inoculate them into a fresh culture. Yeah. And there, there when you put in a very small population, just the amount of time it takes to switch on all the genes for metabolism right. is longer than the time it takes them to die. So. Yeah, so when you, um, when you do the experiment you're describing, uh, indeed there can be a long lag time. Uh, and depending upon the conditions, the lag time can be longer or shorter. But uh, the, the question is whether the lag time in that case is a function of how many cells you inoculate, right? So if, it's, uh, if, if the lag time gets shorter, and, and this is lag time as measured by an individual cell, right? So if I, as a cell in a new environment, if I was at low density, if it's gonna take me five hours, but then with other cells present, if, if I, it's three hours, then that can lead to all these effects that we're talking about. But the key thing is whether individuals benefit from the presence of other individuals in the population. Yeah. And then, okay. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Uh, so, are there examples of other kind of communities other than uh, yeast in which, for example, the community can sort of measure the fluctuations uh, by, for example, some mechanism of quorum sensing or something like that, and and oh. try to to learn how to cope with that and kind of regulate the, the okay. metabolism yeah. or something. Uh, all right, so I want to make sure that we're clear. So um, here we were measuring the fluctuations, uh, whereas the yeast cells, we have no evidence that they were measuring the fluctuations. Um, there are many cases in which microorganisms measure the density of other cells, but they're not, that's just the overall density, not the fluctuations. Okay? Uh, so that would be like quorum sensing. Uh, and then people also do ask whether there are examples where the cells are actually measuring the fluctuations and using that to anticipate a tipping point. Um, that would be wonderful, but we have no evidence that that, um, that, that happens. Does that, does it answer your question? Yeah, okay. Oh, the question is how we measure the fluctuations. What we did is we took um, about 20 different replicate populations, placed them in the di those different environments, and let and watch them fluctuate for um, seven or eight days. Oh, the number, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that the, that data was all just from optical density. So just the, looking at how cloudy they, each population is from day to day. Um, Thank you for the lecture. Um, so taking into account that you want to impact on on natural systems, right? And measuring size and time scale of fluctuations may be prohibitive there. How predictive have you found um, perturbing the, the system and measuring its resilience to be? Yeah. Let's say if you want to upscale it to the fisheries or, or this. Uh, yeah, and this is clearly you know, very important. Uh, and, and, I, you know, there, and there are many things to say. Uh, one is that uh, I, I like these ideas because um, of the universal nature of the phenomena and, uh, and opportunities for making novel measurements. Uh, 
And so I think, uh, so that's why I find it interesting. Um, but interesting is a relatively low bar. You know, I think a lot of things are interesting. Um, useful is a much higher bar, right? And uh, I would, it's not obvious to me whether these ideas are really going to end up being useful in any given circumstance because of the th reasons that you were talking about, that there are major questions about measurement noise and the environment could be doing all sorts of weird things and uh, there, could, there, there are many, many ways in which these things could fail. Uh, we and others have gone out to look at natural populations to try to measure things um, and, uh, and there has been some success. Uh, we uh, just this last year published a paper where we uh, collaborated with a professor at the University of Pisa where he, um, so Professor Benedetti Cecchi uh, does field experiments with these uh, kind of algal mats. That I think of them as miniature forests. Um, they're, um, they're, they're plant, well they're not actually plant, they look like plant communities on, um, the, in the intertidal zone. So this is the region that kind of goes above or below the water depending on the tide. And uh, he basically, uh, he goes out to the islands off the coast of um, Pisa and kind of manipulates these things and then measures how they respond and so forth. Uh, and uh, in this paper that, that came out just maybe nine months ago, we, we demonstrated that we could measure a change in the uh, spatial scale of recovery, these kind of patterns that, um, that we'd originally predicted and, and measured in the context of the lab, but at least in, in this natural community, we could also measure it. So from that perspective, uh, I think that there's a question of which indicators are going to work better or worse. And I, my sense is that fluctuations are probably the hardest thing to measure. Uh, but, uh, but things like, uh, like spatial patterns may be easier because it doesn't require the same high quality time series. because of yeah. linearity, which... Yeah, okay, right, so your, your question is, um, basically maybe as the environment deteriorates, uh, maybe we can see oscillations due to a hop bifurcation. Is that... Uh, um, yeah, we, we love oscillations. Uh, we, um, in this system, uh, we do not think we have a hop bifurcation. Um, we, well, in, uh, you know, and, and tomorrow, if you show up, I'll show you what we think is a hop bifurcation. Um, but a hop bifurcation doesn't always lead to oscillations because it depends on whether there's something else that constrains the orbits later. Um, we think that in, in our cooperator cheater system in this, in this, there is a hop bifurcation, but we think it leads to extinction rather than oscillations. Uh, that being said, we do have a, um, a mutualism uh, between two antibiotic resistant strains that together can grow in the presence of both antibiotics. Uh, that does undergo a hop bifurcation, and we get stable period three limit cycles. Um, yeah. right, thank you.